Part one. Listen to Jane and her friend Sally discussing Jane's preparations to go on a tour abroad. Look at the questions one to five. Who is it? It's me, Sally. The door's open. Hi. Hi. So, have you decided where to go for your big holiday? Finally, I narrowed it down to Southeast Asia, or India and Pakistan, and decided on Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia. Wow, sounds romantic. Decided when you'll leave? I have to be back in time for the new term, so I want to leave by July first. That's a long trip. Three months, nearly. Don't you think it's too long? No, I want to do research on recycling while I'm there for my environmental studies course next year. So I've got tons of things to do. I don't know where to start. First things first: passport, air ticket, and money. How much money are you taking? I hear it's not cheap like it used to be. The passport's okay for another two years. I'll go to the travel agent tomorrow, and I reckon. Three thousand pounds should be plenty. I'm glad I kept doing that horrible waitress job this past three years. A thousand a month sounds plenty, including airfare. No, Dad's got a frequent flyer award, so I should be able to get to Singapore and back for nothing. Yeah, but you have to be careful. Normally, those free ticket things mean you can only fly when there are empty seats. Don't want you to get stuck there until all the rich Asian students have flown back here after seeing their families. Look at questions six to ten. I'll manage, but I'll see what the travel agent has to say. Gosh, July first—that's only a bit over three weeks. Inoculations, all sorts of nasty diseases in those tropical places. Have you checked out the health requirements? Didn't think of it. How do I start? I think there's a Ministry of Health webpage that tells you what injections and pills you need before you go to different countries. Yellow fever, malaria, that sort of stuff. How many countries do you plan on visiting? As many as I can. Singapore, Malaysia. I'd like to get to Sabah and Sarawak in East Malaysia if I can. Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and Indonesia for sure. That's pretty ambitious. How do you plan to get around? As cheap as I can. Don't fancy flying much. Maybe I can get a boat from Singapore to Borneo. You didn't mention Borneo. Oh, that's the big island where Sabah and Sarawak are. Most of it belongs to Indonesia. Oh, I know. And Brunei, right? That little place with tons of oil. Right. Have you still got your camera? Yeah, and Dave has promised me a digital video camera for my birthday. But your birthday isn't until late July. An early birthday present. That's what brothers are for. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute. To check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a talk given to students on going to study in England. First, look at questions eleven to sixteen.
Good morning, everybody. I'm Richard Smethers from International Students Consulting, and welcome to today's talk on what you need to know and think about prior to going to study in the UK. Probably the biggest question is that of housing. It can be very expensive, especially in London, and the halls of residence in most universities are certainly not cheap. That's what you pay for convenience. Probably the best thing for most of you, I believe it's the first time any of you have studied in the UK, is to try to find a vacancy in a coop house with other students. If you are keen to make maximum progress with your English, I would suggest that you try to find accommodation with at least one native speaker. So many foreign students end up living only with people from their own country. And I've actually known cases where their English is worse after three years than when they arrived. One advantage of living with British students is that they'll probably have experience of dealing with landlords, looking after the bills, and other things that might be done quite differently in your home country. So, how to find shared housing, any housing? Arrive early. It's best to try and be in the town or city where you'll be studying. At least a week before the start of term. If you leave it too late, you'll be competing with thousands of other students, all looking for a place to live. And one of your first stops should be the housing office. They have a database of all types of off-campus accommodation, and the early bird catches the worm, as they say. You'll probably meet other students at there in the same boat you are. And chat with people. If you meet any that seem to be the type of people you could get along with, then you might well sort out your accommodation quite quickly with them. Now look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now I know that a few of you will be going with your sponsors. Sharing a house or a flat with other students is probably not what most of you would prefer. If you are trying to save money, a studio flat, which has a bedroom and living room combined and a place to cook, is usually cheaper than a flat with a separate bedroom and a kitchen. But remember, you will probably need somewhere to study at home. Once you have found a place to live, there are a few things you should check out very carefully with the landlord or the estate agent. Quite a few estate agents look after the renting out of housing for one or several landlords. First, how are you going to pay the rent? By the way, I forgot to mention that you should open a bank account very soon after you arrive. You might want to open a savings account. For the bulk of your money, and keep some in a current account for paying the bills. The advantage of the former is that you get more interest on your deposit, but you usually can't write checks or arrange to pay such things as electricity, gas, telephone, and water bills, plus what you owe the landlord. These are normally paid on a monthly or quarterly basis with what are called direct debits. And standing orders, the rent, of course, is usually paid monthly, and most landlords want a deposit of one or two months' rent to pay for any damage you might do. Accidents happen, and it's sad but true that there are thieves everywhere. Make sure you have good locks on your doors and windows, and insist that the landlord or estate agent changes them if they are not up to scratch. You should take out insurance for major items such as personal computers. If you have a car, then insurance is required by law. And if you think you may want to get a car, make sure you take your current driving license with you, because it may help you get cheaper car insurance. But the most important type of insurance you should take out 
is medical insurance. Falling off your bike and breaking your arm can be a very costly business if you are not protected by insurance. Unlike the student union advisory service in your university, I am not allowed to offer you the best advice on what insurance company to use. Now, what about working? If you have a student visa for longer than six months, you can work for up to 20 hours per week during term time, or 40 hours per week otherwise, without applying for permission from the home office. And if you have a UK visa based on a relationship to someone with a long-term visa in the UK, you will normally be free to take up any sort of employment in the UK. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You're going to hear two hosts of a TV program talking about taking notes from lectures. First, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. You now have some time to read questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to How to Study program on the Oxford TV Educational Channel. As usual, we are your hosts, Rick and Rita. Okay, Rick, what's today's topic? Note taking. Right, note taking. It's one of those things most of us students do, but has anyone ever told you how to do it so it can be the greatest help to you? If you had teachers like mine all of your life, probably not. Same here. Rita and I thought of this topic a few weeks ago. Did some research and found that most students don't take or use notes in the best way. Of course, different things work better for different people, but we did manage to come up with some useful basic principles. But first, how do we know it helps? How do we know it isn't better to listen carefully to everything the lecturer says rather than scribble away taking notes? Well. We found that research on note taking has been going on since this guy, Professor C. C. Crawford, began his studies in the 1920s. But we don't have time to tell you all about the different studies that have been done. The important thing is that most researchers agree that taking notes is better than not taking notes, and that reviewing notes is the key to their usefulness. Both are really important. For example, in 1970. A、uh, professor Howe concluded that students were seven times more likely to recall information one week after it was presented if the information had been recorded in their notes. He argued that the note writing activity per se makes a contribution to later retention. But another important thing is that you shouldn't take notes like a human tape recorder. Listen to this, and I quote. There is growing evidence that note-taking combined with critical thinking facilitates retention and applications of the information. As the conversation continues, please answer questions twenty-six to thirty. In fact, in 1979, two researchers found that students who took notes verbatim scored lower on comprehension tests than those who processed information at a high level, which is inhibited by taking notes this way. 
Similarly, in 1985, another researcher found that the most successful students thought about the relationships between the facts the lecturer told them and the better organization of their notes reflected this process. And putting information in different geometric figures, squares, triangles, rings, etc., like in computer programming, to stand for different functions and alternatives improves this reorganization. Okay, now for some practical basics. You start, Rick. 1. Be prepared. Have your notebook open and pen in hand when class begins. 2. Listen for what the teacher emphasizes with words like to summarize. The main point is. And if something is written on the board, you should probably write it down. And if something is repeated, it's probably important. Don't try to write down every word, just the main ideas, content, and information. And develop your own way of abbreviating words. Go over your notes as soon as possible after class. Underline or highlight main ideas, concepts, and information. And last thing, reorganizing notes while reviewing leads to higher test scores. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You're going to hear a talk given to some parents of children with disabilities about a type of therapy. You now have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to our hospital's recreational therapy department. I'm Dr Gillian Roberts and I'm the department head. You all have children who have some form of disability and your family physicians have recommended that they come here for treatment. Many people don't know very much about recreational therapy. It sounds rather like playing to get better. Well, in a way it is. But it's much more than this. So today I'll give you an overview of the basic principles and some common activities of this form of therapy. Please don't hesitate to interrupt me if you have any questions. Let me start by painting a picture in your minds. Imagine a young child with a disability and an adult splashing around, playing and laughing in a swimming pool. For the child, this happy scene is very different from the daily struggle of, for example, learning to walk without crutches. The adult is a recreational therapist. It's fun, but it's also work, and successful work as she sees the improvement in the child's balance, leg motion range, and lower body strength. Equally important, she sees that the child is slowly but surely gaining confidence. So this probably gives you an idea of what recreational therapy is all about. How about a definition? The American Therapeutic Recreation Association describes it as a healthcare and human service discipline that delivers treatment services designed to restore, remediate and or rehabilitate functional capabilities for persons with injuries, chronic illnesses and all types of disabling conditions. Well, that's quite a mouthful, but you can see that it covers a wide range of conditions and patients. At this hospital, we used to specialise in children under 12, while older people went to St James, very close to here. But we found that children can be encouraged by seeing adults doing similar things to what they're doing, and they also get very attached to their therapists. So now both hospitals treat both youngsters and adults, and we work very closely together, especially on research projects. OK, who are the therapists? 
Well, most of them are certified therapeutic recreation specialists, usually simply called recreational therapists. They're certified through the National Council for Therapeutic Recreation Certification, which requires a bachelor's degree or higher, a formal internship, and passing a certification examination. To maintain their certification, they must also participate regularly in professional education activities. Recreational therapists work in a wide range of clinical service areas, but they play an especially important role in the rehabilitation of children with disabling conditions. Their work with children includes such activities as physical play, focused on restoration or maintenance of functioning, and the one-on-one -on -one bedside play with a single child or small group activity. By the way, it seems that so far I've been talking about physical problems. In fact, our work also includes trying to help with psychological problems. For example, educational play focused on understanding upcoming surgery, dramatic or expressive play focused upon coping with fear and anxiety, and family or sibling play to help overcome such things as excessive shyness, hostility, and other emotional problems. What makes recreational therapy different from other forms of therapy? As the name suggests, it's the use of recreational activities as the mode of treatment. The treatment goals that a recreational therapist may work towards are similar to the goals of other disciplines on the rehabilitation team, but the way of achieving those goals is different. Also, the recreational therapist has a holistic perspective that includes the patient's leisure, social, cognitive and physical needs. This means that a recreational therapist may work with a child on one or more of the following functional areas. Physical functioning. Things like mobility, strength and motor skills. Cognitive functioning, such as attention span, memory and problem solving. Emotional functioning, things like self-esteem, confidence and coping skills. Social functioning, how to communicate and interact with others. Sadly, sometimes we also have to help patients learn to manage pain. Other areas include developmental play skills, leisure interests and abilities. Well, that sounds more like something to do with recreation than the other things I just mentioned. As you can imagine, with all those different things that might need to be worked on, a recreational therapist may use a wide range of techniques to meet the needs of each child. After completing a comprehensive assessment, the recreational therapist identifies appropriate treatment goals and decides on the methods to be used. These methods might include leisure skill building, adaptive sports, aquatic therapy. I mentioned splashing around in a pool at the beginning of my talk, therapeutic art, and animal-assisted therapy. This is increasingly popular. It's wonderful how a friendly dog can do more than all the doctors in the world for some disabled kids. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.